get started. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody again to uh, 2018 Almost Heaven Star Party, and glad you were able to get up here, uh, despite the bad weather along the way. As you see, the weather is improving right now. The sun's streaming in, uh, and if it's anything like last night, we had overcast, we had rain, and then we had some perfectly clear skies. So hopefully that same thing happens tonight. Our first speaker for this uh, AHSP is Dr. David Dvorkin, who's a curator of astronomy at the Smithsonian. Um, his expertise and his particular interest is the development of astrophysics in the 20th century. Uh, he has been a friend of Novak and AHSP, having spoken at the club meetings, and th this is at least a second time. Up here, yeah. Up here. Uh, and every time he brings an interesting insight in the historical background of astronomy. Uh, I'm not going to do too much about what his topic is. I think most of you have heard about Fred Whipple. And Dr. Dvorkin has recently written a book, which is actually free online. He's not selling a book, although probably if you print it out, he'll It's right there. Um, so it's available for everyone to read about the development of uh, uh, Whipple's uh, influence on the development of the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. So with that, please welcome Dr. Dvorkin. Thank you, Alan. Well, I'm delighted to be here. I was, vi I was really delighted as I was coming up 28 to see this little sign that said Novak this way. It says, oh my God, I'm in the right place, you know. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a fabulous place up here, and I'm delighted that you've asked me to come up and give you uh, a few thoughts. Now, this is, um, uh, I, I would be happy to make this somewhat informal. If there's something that I'm, I'm blathering on about and you think that uh, everybody needs to know something a little more about it or you want me to uh, 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 emphasize something, I'll be happy to take uh, comments from, from, from all of you uh, during the show. But I think I have uh, an hour, is that correct? And so uh, uh, that we will stick by. And uh, my motive is simple. If I don't get the chance to read every word of the book to you tonight, uh, you just have to read it online. Now, it's actually very easy to find. Uh, all you have to do is, f is Google it with quotes, Fred Whipple's Empire, and uh, the website comes right up. Uh, at least it did for me. I don't know how Google works these days, and it must know me well enough to know what I'm after but uh, it might work for all of you. The book actually just arrived in print today. Uh, as I was driving here, I, uh, I got a, a, a message saying, congratulations, the book is on your desk. So uh, you are the first uh, people to um, uh, 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 be subjected to uh, my review when the book is actually a reality. And it is a uh, Smithsonian Institution uh, publication. It's a federal publication. It's published on demand, but it's free anytime on, online. I've been interested in Fred Whipple for many years, uh, and I labored over what to call this book. And you see the result here. But I think uh, I put the, an earlier title in my, uh, my abstract to you, and it was The Many Worlds of Fred Whipple. What's Whipple best known for? Dirty Snowball. There's a dirty Snowball Theory, that's right, for comets. But what he's really known for are all those little rocks inside the snowball, his many worlds. He, s he started out, and I'll be talking a little bit about Whipple, but this is not a biography of Whipple. This is more an institutional thing. But Whipple, w Whipple's the guy who... Uh, who first figured out uh, that uh, uh, comets are, have a very low tensile strength, and he did that by observing different meteor swarms and when they evaporated in the Earth's upper atmosphere, but we'll get to that later. So let's get to this. The topic today is, how did two observatories, the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, or as it was called at the time, the Astrophysical Observatory, APO, of the Smithsonian Institution. And you see where it used to be? That's the Smithsonian Castle. And Independence Avenue was down around here. Anybody ever been down there? You know where it is. Okay, well that's where it was. And it was a bunch of little low buildings. And Harvard, uh, on the Harvard campus, and this is the 15 inch refractor here, in the 1940s, looked something like that. And my book is about how these two institutions came together 
to produce the uh, Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, as it's called today. But it wasn't called that until 1973. It moved to uh, Harvard, Smithsonian moved to Harvard in 1955, and the book is about that period between 55 and 73. Well, what, let's see, what do I do here? Oh, okay. Uh, I, I want to start by admitting that I'm a historian, and that means that I'm interested in various patterns. Uh, historians of science are interested in patterns in science and how scientists behave. You know, I, I, I grew up building telescopes and being fascinated by the universe, but as I got a little and, and worked together to uh, learn more about the universe. So I use a, uh, SAO as a case study illustrating these changing patterns. Uh, now, the patterns, as they are uh, pretty much uh, uh, described in the 20th century, are not only of practice, but of patronage. It depends on who's paying the bills. And the people paying the bills have certain motives and drives, and the people who are doing the astronomy know that. And so that is something that can change. Uh, it, it changed from an internal bureau of the Smithsonian that was supported by private and allocated federal funding with the express purpose of being useful, providing useful knowledge for the, um, uh, for the advancement of society. Uh, and that was in the 1890s. And it changed to becoming a remote bureau of the Smithsonian, supported all, still by private, but both allocated and competitive federal funding, uh, and joint appointments with academic staff of a major research university, that's Harvard. That's quite a change. And so the question is, why, why did, how did this happen? And why did it happen? It, it wasn't foreordained. Um, the Smithsonian is a quasi-federal institution. I'm a federal employee. Uh, most of the work that I do is supported uh, by uh, uh, private funding, uh, but that private funding is usually competitively drawn. So the Smithsonian is an interesting hybrid, and then it hooks up with Harvard. What caused it to do so? That's what I'll talk to you about today. Oh, why, let's see. I'll, I'll get used to this, I promise. So we'll start with the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. It was first conceived, the idea of an astrophysical observatory was conceived by Joseph Henry, the first secretary of the Smithsonian in the 1850s and 1860s. And the way that he conceived of it, uh, and it embodies his philosophy of building observatories to view nature, to examine and explore nature. His whole uh, dream was to build an observatory that could study winds, cloud, temperature, magnetic fields, the sun, the stars, but be invisible to them so that they not affect the phenomena and allows you to observe the phenomena unaffected. There's a series of letters from Joseph Henry to people like James Lick, Charles Yerkes earlier on, um, uh, the McCormick brothers, and uh, people, uh, various patrons in England, pleading with them if they are patronizing astronomy, please do so, but don't build monuments because the monuments don't really help you. Um, they remove you from nature. So you look at the observatory that, that was built in his memory. There's no domes. Uh, everything's made out of wood because there's magnetic studies going on. And it was environmentally neutral. That was the key for Joseph Henry. And the person who agreed with him was Samuel Pierpont Langley. Langley, primarily an engineer, and he's known, of course, famous for his aeronautics work, uh, in my mind is equally famous for starting solar physics in the United States uh, from an instrumental standpoint. He and, and Charles Young are the two who really started it going. But Langley was at Pittsburgh um, building the early Allegheny Observatory, building all sorts of interesting physical experiments, and uh, came to the Smithsonian uh, to fill in uh, Joseph Henry's vision. Joseph Henry had passed away. Uh, Spencer Baird was the secretary, brought in Langley to establish the Astrophysical Observatory of the Smithsonian to perform observations that would be useful to mankind. In other words, study the sun, measure its energy output, and help to determine if the sun's energy output varies over time. And if it does, uh, you can help, you know, uh, quietly help people understand crop futures and things like that. Kind of an interesting task for 19th century America. 
Langley, of course, immediately went in. He came here. He built the observatory. He went right into aeronautics, as we know, uh, and left pretty much the whole astrophysical agenda to Charles Greeley Abbott. And Charles Abbott was a very intense, very, very focused person. It was very, very hard to get his attention. Hey, hey, Abbott. There he is. Okay. <laughs> we just want to wake him up, make sure he's, he's with us. He became the director of the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory in uh, uh, about 1903, 1904, in name only, but with power after Langley died in 1907. And from there through 1944, uh, he led it and eventually the Smithsonian itself in this one project of studying the constancy of the solar uh, energy output. Uh, he built observatories all over the world, Mount Wilson, Mount Whitney, uh, Kalama, Montezuma down in South America, Harquahala, Table Mountain on the West Coast, Brukharo in, in Egypt, St. Catherine in Egypt, uh, all over the place. Uh, to simply monitor the sun. They also, we also, we being the Smithsonian, built instruments and standardized them and sent them to observatories all over the world to monitor the amount of energy we receive by the sun on a daily basis. Here are some of the images uh, from those observatories. The Mount Wilson uh, Tower, the first tower at Mount Wilson, but well before the 60 foot that Hale built, was by uh, the Smithsonian Abbott. And there's one of Abbott's assistants. His name was Loyal B. Aldrich. He, had, he really had to be loyal. He spent his whole life with him, carrying some uh, visitors uh, on, a, on a tramway to view the uh, solar tower. Other instruments, you can see the heliostats and everything set up all over the world. The whole idea was to measure the solar constant as, as precisely as possible and to search for changes in the solar constant. Abbott went farther. He wanted to, he knew the atmosphere, of course, the Earth's atmosphere was highly variable. And so he built little instruments that sent thermometers, very sophisticated thermometers, high into the atmosphere under balloons between 1910 and 1914. And it was at that time that he established the modern value of the solar constant, how much energy we're receiving from the sun per square centimeter per second. And uh, we have one of these uh, in the collection, one of them that never flew because it, it, they didn't survive. But I also recently found uh, bunches of parts of it that did fly and were retrieved. And we have reconstructed some of these and they are ingenious little automatons that could record solar energy photographically over time as a function of altitude. Interesting stuff. So it was good science. Now, at Abbott stuck to this throughout his entire career and, and his close contacts with uh, Congress in, United, in, in Washington, D.C. helped keep the SAO, or, uh, or I should say the APO, open and prospering to a certain extent throughout the 20s and even in the Depression era 30s. He was a very, very uh, good um, preacher for uh, solar variations. You can see a lovely picture of him in later life here. Uh, he has a mother's oats can, all right? And he wraps his data around the mother's oats can, and he would unravel it, showing you the variations in solar a a activity, and then when he was done, he got to mother's oats and hold it up and said, who wouldn't, you know, who, who could possibly doubt mother? And that sold Congress, that sold all sorts of people. But it didn't sell in the post-World War II period a man named Leonard Carmichael, who was the first academic secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. Leonard Carmichael was facing a new world after World War II. And that new world uh, was pretty much a, a demonstration of the power of science, the incredible power of science for national security. No one knew that better than Vannevar Bush. Vannevar Bush uh, led the uh, organization of science in World War II that led to some of the most, uh, as you know, frightful but also powerful uh, methods of both defense and offense uh, that we still live with today. And during this time, there was a restructuring of the entire um, uh, government, uh, federal government in Washington, D.C., uh, that many bureaus were being reorganized and put under different places to make them more effef effective, to make them more efficient, uh, to get them more responsive to national needs. 
Uh, the, the scariest was that the Smithsonian may be included in one of the various reorganization proposals offered by the executive office of the president, and this was during the Truman administration, redelegating the authority uh, to consult with other agencies to a third non-scientific agency which would um, not save anything. That's what they were arguing against. But the bottom line was that uh, there were people in Congress saying they want to subordinate the Smithsonian to the General Services Administration. If the Smithsonian uh, uh, had been existing successfully, more or less, as an independent agency, it and it wasn't the only one targeted this way, had to demonstrate its value uh, or n lose its independence. And the question is, how do you demonstrate value? And value at that time in the post-World War era was relevance to national security. Carmichael set up a scientific board that examined uh, not only the natural history people, but the, but the uh, Smithsonian uh, astrophysical people. And they're, they're unanimous in their feeling that it's high time that a more modern research program w had to be undertaken. This monitoring of the sun is fine, but it's not really leading to anything. Some people believe it, some people don't. In fact, I have to admit, uh, Abbott uh, was a great observer, a great instrument builder, but when, when it came to analyzing his data, uh, as one of his own uh, subordinates said, uh, he preferred the data that gave him the answer he wanted. Not good, and this was known by some astronomers. So something had to be done. Abbott was no longer in charge. Uh, he was now actually, for a while, he had been secretary, but he even was retired as secretary uh, in 1944. And so he was out of the picture. But he was still around uh, uh, and, and quite a force to, to contend with. Okay, that's where the Smithsonian was in the early 50s. Now let's look at Harvard. I said, oh my God, Harvard. I mean, Harvard, that's astronomy in America, isn't it? Don't you think so? Oh, come on. It sure as heck was in the 1950s and 60s. But then these, these guys started building these big telescopes on the West Coast, you know, and, and they had better sky. How dare them, you know? Well, Harvard has an interesting story also to tell. It had indeed became the biggest and most far-flung ob uh, observatory institution on the planet by World War II, uh, pr primarily through the work of Harlow Shapley. Shapley, at his famous desk here, which uh, uh, an Antique Telescope Society member um, has, has resurrected and, and constructed in his, in his, uh, his, his home in Belmont, uh, thank God, because it was going to be trashed by, by the observatory. Shapley had this desk, it was actually built by his predecessor, Pickering, uh, who compartmentalized his projects. And so as he changed from project to project, the desk rotated. Well, what do you think of that? I mean, oh, what kind of guy does that? And Shapley took that on and, and kept it going for many, many years. But he had developed such a huge empire across the world and also a staff of very, very uh, I influential and, and, and well-known astronomers. There's Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin, Donald Menzel, Mr. Sun, uh, Annie Cannon. All right, here's a test. Anybody can tell me what Annie Cannon did? Yeah, absolutely. Well, on top of the fact that Harvard was collecting more spectra than the rest of the world in the late 19th century, but she organized the system. There's Fred Whipple. And how about Leon Campbell? Anybody familiar with that name? Ever hear of the AAVSO? Oh, yeah, yeah. Campbell was an early, very, very influential person. And the AAVSO was uh, very much uh, created and supported with, uh, with the um, uh, beneficence of E.C. Pickering before Shapley. So there were wonderful staff involved, but over, over time, through the 30s, they were tasked to build observatory facilities all over the place, and it got pretty, let's see, I hope I hit the right one there. It got really difficult maintaining them in Arequipa, in Boyden, at Oak Ridge, uh, outside of, of Harvard. 
And in fact, the observatory was really getting decrepit uh, by World War II, and people began worrying about it. Well, in Shapley's wake, he re reached, um, shall we say, a retirement age in the early 1950s. And uh, normally, you know, somebody with his status uh, would be allowed to stay on. But Shapley was also a very political creature, and he ha did not um, get along well with the president of Harvard University, James Bryant Conant. Uh, Conant never publicly uh, uh, went after Shapley, but he uh, had to find ways to control him. Shapley was, uh, of course, um, uh, fearless in his uh, defense of uh, academic freedom uh, and would chastise people like uh, Senator McCarthy, you've heard him, and the McCarthy uh, uh, House. And Shapley, of course, was, was labeled pink. Uh, he was far too humanitarian. Uh, he was losing a lot of, of, you might say, political stature, even though he was very strong in UNESCO. Even UNESCO was considered to be a, uh, a red organization at that time. So Conant encouraged Shapley to retire, it essentially said, you will retire. And the question was what to do in Shapley's wake. Conant brought in a good buddy of his, J. Robert Oppenheimer. Ever hear of him? Yep. Oppenheimer had already advised the physics department in World War II at Harvard to how to be more effective and everything, and uh, thought he could do the same with the astronomy department. And he brought in primarily uh, West Coast astronomers and East Coast physicists and formed a team to say, what can we do with Harvard? The general feeling uh, of the astronomer Bank Gr uh, Binked Stromgren, who was uh, at Yerkes at that time and was on the committee, uh, was that uh, the people were good when they were appointed. Uh, they're still good, but the group is by no means strong. If left to itself, it would not have the strength to build up a first-class institution in observational astronomy, even if the money was available. This is an indictment. And it went on this way. It was just really stunning. So Harvard was not in good shape. They were talking about closing the, uh, the department, making it a part of physics, uh, replacing it with a theoretical department because they couldn't compete with the obser ob observatories in the West. They brought in uh, astronomers, too. Donald Menzel uh, uh, with uh, Leo Goldberg and uh, Robert McMath were also uh, advising uh, what to do about, about Harvard. Now, why, why is Menzel there? Menzel was a Harvard staff member. Oppenheimer's committee, and this is a very long story, you've got to read my book. Um, Oppenheimer's committee did try to bring in outside astronomers. They tried Stromgren, they tried Struve, they tried others. Nobody would take the job because it was an impossible situation because they knew that Conant was stacked against them. And uh, it was a very, very tough time. So finally they made Menzel acting director. And so Menzel's strategy was he had to make astronomy acceptable to the Harvard Corporation. That was not easy. And he had to do some things that uh, gave him a rather uh, dark uh, reputation among astronomers and others. But uh, part of my book's effort is to try to help people appreciate what Menzel was up to because the alternative was that astronomy would die. So Menzel brought in Goldberg, who was also one of the students, and they started asking, what can, what can we do at Harvard? Menzel also knew that something was happening at the Smithsonian because they had very, very good uh, connections in, in, in Washington and knew that there may be a new way to uh, create a new hybrid entity at Harvard that could uh, survive all of this. He also did things that made people really ticked off. The Boyden Station, the Southern Station that was run by Bart Bach and, and others, uh, was closed. There was a whole protest letter. These are graduate students and uh, research assistants and junior staff at Harvard writing to protest the closing of the Boyden Station. Now, Harvard didn't close it. They simply said, we can no longer support it. Uh, we want to give it away to uh, other observatories. But this was not fully understood. I've interviewed Owen Gingrich and various other people on this list about this. The communication was very, very poor. Menzel also cleaned up the library 
Uh, you may have heard from people like Dorit Hofleit and Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin that he cleaned up the plate stacks, you know, the famous Harvard plate stacks. He, got, uh, he had people cull them, uh, trying to appear to be responsible. He evicted the AAVSO. Here is a, um, uh, mainly because the buildings that Shapley had built had become so decrepit that nobody could really safely live in them. But this is how Menzel did it. We hope to start build, uh, tearing down building A, and uh, uh, this is where they were, and so we would appreciate if you would plan to make the move uh, by that date. And that would be January, and he tells them, gives them a month's notice. Pretty blunt. And this was the reaction that I found on the wall there. Uh, in, uh, but then it had uh, a copy of it was in Dorit Hoflight's uh, papers. Uh, a woodsman uh, chopping down a tree and the AVSO uh, squirrels moving their, uh, uh, I guess, what, what do they eat? Acorns? Okay, very good. Yeah. So what was Menzel's strategy? Uh, he knew that he could compete with the West Coast because of the quality of the staff, but he had to organize them differently. The accretion of new capabilities through institution building, promoting inward migration. By that, I mean bringing people in with talent to migrate into astronomy uh, and, to, and to share their talents and trainings. SAO as a research reserve, a very interesting term at that time. What was a research reserve? Um, in the post-World War II period, there was a very strong uh, move to, uh, you know, when we move to a peacetime economy, we still have to remain ready, ready to fight. And so the reserve was created, as we understand it today. But it was a very big thing, I'm sure some of you remember, in the 50s. Well, Menzel saw the same thing in research. He wanted to gather groups of scientists with high expertise, let them do whatever they wanted, but if a problem came along, they'd be focused on that problem. That's the research reserve, and he saw Harvard as becoming one of those things. To be on tap, but as well as on top. This was the whole dynamic at the time of how to take advantage of military funding, but still keep some control of the problems that you, you, you address. He turned to Whipple to make that happen. And I won't go through all of the details, but Whipple, Menzel knew about the closing of the uh, Smithsonian. Uh, and Menzel gave the job to Whipple to convince the Harvard to bring the Smithsonian to Harvard. Whipple did that. Now by then, Whipple was very adept at what you might say is military patronage. He had built the most powerful meteor uh, cameras in, in, in the world and spread them around to be able to um, uh, 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 far better understand uh, the origins of meteors and also the nature of the upper atmosphere. He wrote a landmark paper in 1939 showing how you can use meteor trails to understand the uh, structure of the upper atmosphere. Now, post, that was a nice academic question at that time, but what changed with World War II? It's called the V-2 missile. It's called ballistic missiles became the war of the future. And how do you make a ballistic missile work? It has to go through the atmosphere. Okay, how do you make it hit its target? You've got to know exactly what the temperature, the density, the composition of that atmosphere is. And so that became the key. It revolutionized that part of astronomy. So the, what are called super Schmitts, uh, were the design that were developed, uh, the most fantastic meteor camera you can, uh, you can imagine. It, it vastly increased the ability to capture both faint and bright meteors. Uh, the man who created it was James Baker. Uh, you may have heard of him, a legendary optician. During the war, he led an optical bureau uh, at Harvard that uh, uh, brought in amateur telescope makers of Boston, and they uh, produced every kind of optical uh, device in quantity uh, that met the needs of, uh, of the services at that time. But he also advanced the science at that time, looking at better ways to map very large uh, parts of the sky. Uh, and this would be for missile tracking as well as for satellite tracking eventually and uh, for uh, all the kinds of purposes that the Army uh, and, and Navy and Air Force were interested in. So that was, that was the, um, 
that was the infrastructure that Whipple had available. Now, Whipple's own career, and I won't go through it uh, just beyond this one point here, uh, he really got into meteors big time in the 1930s. He was the one who d determined, was the first to determine that meteors were not extrasolar. In other words, meteor orbits were not hyperbolic. There were plenty of people who were thought that meteors came from, from the space beyond the planets. And that was a very important question in cosmogony, the origins of the planetary systems. Whipple showed they weren't. They were, they were uh, elliptical. And he did this with, with uh, uh, better equipment and better um, uh, data. So he parlayed that to, with military funding to better understand ballistics in the upper atmosphere, hyperballistic studies. And throughout this time, he was also, of course, uh, leveraging his own personal interests. Uh, I, uh, I remember as a child, you know, reading about going into space, you know, the conquest of space, the Collier series, uh, work, uh, you know, Willie Lay, Chesley Bonestell. And then there was this guy, Fred Whipple. He wrote a lot of stuff with them. He was a dreamer. He, was, he believed in a space station. That was the way to go. He was a, con uh, he was a colleague of Von Braun's. He was looking for a way to get, break the bonds of Harvard, was not particularly interested in uh, uh, military uh, thing, um, uh, activity like that. And he found the opportunity in the Smithsonian. So, okay, oh, there's all the Whipples. He established this, uh, the first series of stations all over the world. And then he mimicked them with a new set of stations with what are called the Baker Nunn uh, cameras, which you may have heard of, which were the first satellite tracking cameras. And when uh, I interviewed him back in 1977, he was very clear about this, and I've also gone back and checked on this. Uh, I asked him, why did you, why did you take up this, this uh, Smithsonian business? I mean, the Smithsonian was moribund. He said, sure, it was moribund, but it was a, it was a funding line literally a funding line. What I had in mind, why I took the job of the directorship was so that I could then operate this photographic satellite observing program under the aegis of the Smithsonian, which is very open and world, you know, uh, world based, rather than Harvard, which was at that time very parochial. So uh, with Menzel's request, Whipple uh, agreed to take over. Is there a problem? No, I'm sorry, I was looking at a dragonfly. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> the Baker Nuns were the uh, most amazing expression of high-speed uh, reconnaissance cameras. Uh, they could not take single shots. They had to take re uh, roll shots because they had to take and track satellites. They were very effective. Uh, they got onto the cover of Life magazine, as some of you may remember, and they started bringing Whipple's Dear Dream to fruition. Here's an, uh, one of the ways that the staff recognize the tracking system. You know, those are soda straws. And the whole key to tracking a satellite was that you had to be able to see it from more than one station. At a, and two stations had to triangulate and constantly triangulate. And so they used those straws to represent it. And uh, <laughs> I remember talking to some people saying, oh, they were just joking. I said, no, nah, that, that looked like a pretty good uh, way to visually uh, understand the problem of tracking satellites. Have it, any of you in a AVSO? None of you? Oh, that's too bad. Okay. The campaign that went on to attract amateurs to the A, uh, not the AVSO, I mean the, um, uh, the moon watch tracking. Anybody do any moon watch work? No? Okay. You're still looking at the dragonfly. Okay. Well, it attracted thousands of people in the 1956 to 57, 58 period. And they were organized into teams. Whoops. Organized into teams. There's a model of one of the teams. Here they would each look at a part of the meridian defined by this bar and wait for a satellite to come over. And when it did, the person who saw it, because they were each one looking at a different altitude, the person who saw it would yell, contact! and then a person would press a button, and that record would go to the Central Smithsonian. This was the first way that they started tracking satellite orbits, and I'm talking about the early Sputniks. We had no tracking facilities 
until this time. And that was the first step. A really uh, an amazing success. Um, there are some amateurs that you may know. Certainly, here's Tommy Cragg. He's a well-known amateur. And Leonard is another one here. This is Margaret Mayall and Armin Spitz's wife, uh, Grace Spitz, is here. Here are the people who were organizing. Oh, and this is Walter Haas, uh, director of the ALPO, the ALPO, Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. This was a, uh, the National Advisory Committee that uh, Whipple put together uh, to organize this. And so this made Smithsonian a really, really visible entity. But this was Smithsonian at Harvard. The stations were all over the place. Uh, Sky and Telescope featured them. Many other magazines did as well. It also brought in some, a, a lot of money into the Smithsonian. Uh, here, are, here are just some of the sur early service contracts. And in 57, they started getting bigger and bigger. And uh, the, the Astrophysical Observatory at that time was really becoming a new, a new way to do science. And uh, you can see it here in Whipple's um, comment to Werner von Braun in January 1956. Everything they, was, they were doing was with the best wishes for the conquest of space. That's what was driving Whipple. That's what Conant saw in Whipple. And that's what Menzel saw in Whipple. Space is the answer to uh, 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 maintaining uh, astronomical uh, uh, power uh, on the East Coast. Well, we know about the space age and, of course, the uh, tracking stations and the tracking groups flourished through the early 60s. Uh, got onto the cover of Life magazine more time than you can imagine. Uh, here's J. Allen Hynek. Anybody know that name? Oh, yeah. He was, he was uh, Whipple's organizer for, for Project Moonwatch. But then the question was, what does this SAO do with this space stuff? Uh, now, the typical way an astronomer chooses a project is that, you know, you have a question. I want to learn about binaries. I want to determine the masses of binary stars. And, you know, they would go about determining those masses with the best kind of observations. What kind of telescope would you build? What would you do? What would you do? Whipple had a completely different vision for getting for developing space astronomy. Space astronomy was an organizational tool for him. He used it to get involved with the space program, to make the space program, he tried to make the space program an academic-based activity, primarily based at the Smithsonian at Harvard. That was his appeal in April 1958 to Congress when he was asked to testify uh, when the NASA bill came up. Of course, it didn't happen. But meanwhile, he was organizing his own staff to look at all the different things they could possibly do with access to space. And the space telescope comes up top, of course. And I'll talk a little bit about that. The idea is we want to aim as high as possible. We'll concentrate most on the space telescope, they called it. Now, what was a space telescope at that time? It was a little different than we think of them this time. Uh, you know that the space telescope, the idea was first uh, described in 1946 uh, by Princeton astronomer uh, Lyman Spitzer. And he just said, once we gain the capability, we have to start thinking about how to observe from space. Well, this is how they did it. Uh, it had to be a television system. Well, I mean, what are the, what's the problems with a space telescope? What's the primary problem with it? Putting a telescope in space to observe the universe. What's the big problem? <laughs> Getting the data down getting the data back, right? Of course, you could send people up there, but that's a little more expensive. Maybe that'll come, but meanwhile, how do you get it back? Television. So they said, okay, we've got to build a television telescope. Well, that had not gotten very far at that time, so that was quite an audacious uh, activity. Uh, at that time, even the best uh, image tube experts and ever, everything were saying that they are still of limited use to the working astronomer. They're experimental, maybe in a few years. But Whipple went ahead with it. Why? Not because he wanted to build the biggest uh, space telescope in the world, 
but because he knew setting a goal like that would help him build the biggest organization in the world. That's the key to Whipple's work. Uh, how do I get, oh, I think I had the wrong button. Here's the idea of the organization. It would be tracking stations, it would be uh, analyzing uh, the data, uh, these would be all over the world, uh, they had to be coordinated. Uh, there were huge spreadsheets that he developed for what it would take to uh, grow this, this space uh, telescope, which, by the way, eventually became part of the Orbiting Astronomical Observatory series that NASA ran. And uh, that's a whole nother story. But uh, Hynek again worked with him. They started out with an extremely simple device, a uh, basically Herschelian reflector, uh, that uh, a one element Herschelian that would feed a, a television tube. Uh, it, uh, when NASA got a hold of it, they said, no, 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 we've got to be a little more sophisticated here. And they, uh, they morphed that into a tw uh, set of four 12 inch um, catadioptic reflectors, each feeding an image tube. Uh, and image tubes were just barely coming online at that time, but they were very, very erratic. Uh, and there's one in our collection. So th this became a huge project, uh, which was called Celescope. And uh, what did it do? It built the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. Here's a bar chart, uh, and it, those numbers in yellow are the numbers of people at the observatory. And the uh, contributions of various other projects are seen in blue and light blue. Celescope built are in the, in the hatched red. So you see what Whipple was doing. He was building an observatory using this as a means. By the late uh, 50s, early 60s, there were many divisions. They were huge divisions, building like anything. They were renting space all over uh, Cambridge. Um, and I'm only going to now go through, uh, let's say, one of the many, many, many things the Smithsonian did, the one closest to Whipple's heart, meteors, because that also is one of the neatest stories. And then I think we're uh, uh, ready for questions or, or drinks or something. Okay. By the way, do you know what Whipple's first contribution was as a graduate student? 1930, 31? He was really good at computing orbits. What did he compute? Who, what orbit did he compute? Pluto. He was the first, he and another grad student, Leuschner at Berkeley. But he took that ability at co orbital computation and he applied it. To, he never went back to Pluto. He stuck with things closer to home, and that was meteor swarms, trying to get at what, how they moved, where they came from. He was interested in all forms of meteoritic work. You can see it from the dust, uh, meteoritic materials. Uh, he used meteor, meteor studies as useful for ablation studies and ballistics. In other words, as meteors travel through the atmosphere in hyperballistic studies, they are, of course, ablated by friction in the atmosphere. That's the same thing that would happen in a reentry capsule. So by studying the meteors and knowing what the meteors are made out of, you can better build a space system. So all of these kinds of things uh, came together in Whipple's mind, but he was interested most in terminal ballistics, the formation of craters in the Earth's crustal history. He was also interested in the origin of lunar craters. Were they volcanic or were they meteoritic? He thought they were meteoritic. Many people thought they were volcanic. How do you decide? Well, you go there, right? The author waits with the greatest eagerness for first-hand information concerning the correctness of his conclusions that the features were meteoritic. When the first landings on the moon will provide the answers, 1959. Okay, Whipple was really upfront and on board. He hired geologists. He hired a whole bunch of geologists and meteor mineralogists, bringing them in from different places to study meteoritic samples, to be ready to be able to study lunar samples when they came back, even before Apollo. And of course, I'm having a senior moment. What's her name? Oh, Lord. <laughs> it'll, it'll come to me. But she was the glue in the meteoritic group 
who brought in laboratory spectroscopy, mineralogy, and uh, sampling procedures. That's a picture of her uh, on the uh, uh, Antarctic ice cap looking at something that's obviously extraterrestrial. How else would it have gotten there? She teamed up with uh, another group of people. Uh, this guy John Wood is in the middle. It, it'll come to me. All I need is a beer and it'll come to me. I, I'm very embarrassed about this. I, I've worked with her. She's, she also interviewed astronomers for many years. She recently passed away. And I think that's why I'm blocking her and I feel terrible. Okay, they formed a wonderful group and they campaigned to be part of the, one of the scientific teams that would analyze the lunar materials coming back from the moon. And they were uh, not superstars at the time. They weren't the Harold Urys and the Kuipers and the, you know, and the geology types because the geologists really, really got big in this and it was a real uh, competitive war. And so as John Wood like uh, told me in, a, in an interview and also told her, he made the point, well, we settled for the dust. We settled just for that lunar dust, okay? Because we couldn't get those big fancy rocks. Well, all you have to do is look back at Whipple's writings and you realize that Whipple told them years ago that the dust is what you want because the dust is samples from all over the lunar surface. If it's meteoritic, these, the mare are made of impact ejecta. And th that impact ejecta will give them a combination of the, of the, of the deep structure of, of the moon's mantle, if it has a mantle, plus the materials that it gouged up uh, and when it exploded, as opposed to volcanic. And that's what they went with. During that time, I think it was after Apollo 11, it was John Wood and Ur Ursula Marvin, thank God, David, Ursula Marvin. Anybody know that name? Oh, she's just, she, she was a gem. Uh, everybody said, you know, how do you get, you know, mineralogists, meteoriticists, geologists, uh, planetary physicists, how do you get them to talk to one another? Well, just put Ursula in there and she'll get them all talking. Now, she was just, she was wonderful. She was wonderful. Okay, my, my, my senior moment is gone. That was only one of the many projects, the first uh, real an analysis of, of the Apollo lunar stuff made in an infrastructure that Whipple had built at, at Harvard with Smithsonian funding. But also with Smithsonian funding, you may know of the MMT and in the southern uh, part of Arizona. Uh, the building up of Mount Hopkins is a very, very interesting story. Uh, at the time when people were fighting over uh, putting telescopes in Hawaii, putting them uh, uh, all over uh, the place, Whipple wanted a place that was not too far away, but had exceptionally good seeing and could be a base for operations that could be used to develop the technologies further. And the MMT, is, whoop, sorry about that, MMT is a good example because it was proposed not as a way only to expand the effective diameter of, of a telescope, you know, a telescope's aperture, and I assume you all know about the MMT, or do you? Multi-mirror Multi telescope. Yeah, it was built in the 70s uh, on Mount Hopkins. It's 672 inch mirrors, uh, and it gives you the equivalent um, a resolution because they're phased of 176 inch, or two, um, you know, mirror, or even larger. Well, it was, it was put in as a prototype. It was, it was asked, uh, uh, they asked for money for it as a prototype. Think about that. What's being built today are the ones where the elements are not 72 inches, but are eight meters. And it, indeed, the MMT became the prototype. So he was thinking in the future. It was also a very effective way to use military technologies because those 672-inch mirrors came from the military reconnaissance program. And uh, they were available and of extreme high quality. It's another very long and interesting story. But as a result of all of that, the Smithsonian uh, occupied Mount Hopkins in southern Tucson, uh, the south of Tucson, built telescopes there that ended up doing some really amazing things. This one, this is the 60-inch Tillinghast. It was the very first telescope, a large telescope, built at Mount Hopkins in the 60s. 
And they built it in a very interesting way. Uh, they built it, uh, the astronomers built it, by bringing in various specialty contractors, but no general contractor. The astronomy department became the general contractor. Why? Because it would teach them how to build a bigger one. So no matter what they were building, they were always thinking, oh, this is just a next step to a bigger, 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 bigger. And that's, that's what they were doing. Well, uh, this telescope eventually, and I'll show it to you in a minute, uh, became the telescope that discovered the bubbles and voids in the universe. And I'll show you the instrument that, that did that. This telescope, the LOR, which stands for Large Optical Reflector, uh, detected Kerenkov radiation uh, from the atmosphere of the Earth. And it was the first really, uh, the beginning of gamma ray astronomy, which is a very big deal now these days. And this collection of dishes, which is in the post 70s and 80s, uh, has started uh, uh, the Veritas uh, regime, which is uh, super high resolution studies of gamma ray sources. So there's a lot of good stuff that was coming out of this, but Whipple knew no limits. In the late 1960s, with all of these other projects going, uh, he and some of his staff members decided that they wanted to build the biggest steerable radio telescope in the world. Uh, the Haystack, if you've ever heard of Haystack in, uh, in uh, Massachusetts with Lincoln Labs, that had a very big, fully steerable in a, in a ray dome. Uh, and the people there were uh, anxious to build something much bigger uh, that could do astronomy as well as um, military type of activities. Well, this is a proposed 440 foot vertical truss antenna in a ray dome. Whipple and the secretary of the institution at that time, Dylan Ripley, tried to build, get Congress to fund this uh, to reestablish uh, the leadership of uh, radio astronomy in the United States. There was only one problem. We already had a National Science Foundation that was heavily funding radio astronomy, and you're going to be visiting NRAO. And NRAO was proposing the VLA at that time, the Very Large Array. These two things clashed in Congress. The VLA and the radio, and Congress asked, uh, Harvey Brooks and people like that started asking, well, you know, who speaks for astronomy? NSF, NASA, or the Smithsonian? At that point, that was 1971, 72, things had gotten just out of, out of control. But it was an exciting thing to watch. If you looked at Harvard and SAO budgets from 56 to 66, you'll see that the personnel in Cambridge started, well, Harvard had 78 people, by 1966 had 193, SAO started with 12, and by 1966 had 375, and it was still going up, way up. The contracts and grants were just huge. SAO was dominating everything. Is that what SAO really was needed for? That was the question that Congress started asking. And so in the early 1970s, there was an examination of the Smithsonian uh, by Congress. Um, uh, I can skip that. They were looking at, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, they were looking at the data here, just up to 1970, and you can see, if you, if you don't see this beginning peak and drop, there were over almost 550 people working at the Smithsonian at the time. It was by far the largest astronomical institution on the planet, doing things that were never thought to be astronomy. And Congress started saying, what, what's going on here? This is uh, the uh, uh, funding totals, that sort of thing. Well, the Office of Management and Bud Budget finally came back and said, like many other Smithsonian activities, SAO's growth was generally unstructured. Uh, that's the kiss of death. So something had to be done. And there's a very long and poignant story, but it resulted in Whipple of retiring and stepping down, but it also resulted in the directorships of Harvard and Smithsonian becoming one under uh, George Field, this, this fellow right here. George Field was a theorist, a very broadly based theorist who was at the interface of theory and, and observational work from Princeton. 
uh, had been on many, many uh, congressional committees and had a very good sense of what would sell, what would not sell, that was still good science. And uh, he and Whipple uh, got along very well. Uh, David Chalinor, the Undersecretary of the Smithsonian, brokered how they got along together. And Whipple finally agreed to uh, retire and step down in, in 73, 1973. He lived till 2004. Uh, George Field went on, restructured the uh, Center for Astrophysics, it was called, under a single directorship, and they continued to build, uh, but not in an unstructured way. George uh, was extremely careful in mapping out programs that were in tune with uh, national priorities in what is called the decadal surveys. Have you ever heard about the decadal surveys? Since the 1960s, astronomers have said, what is it that they want? And oh, by the way, do you know where the decadal surveys came from? You mean you haven't read my paper 30 years ago? Okay, let me, this is for your visit to NRAO, all right? Have you ever heard of Sugar Grove? Okay, it's not too far from NRAO. There was a, it was a planned Navy 660-foot steerable reflector. And they got a bunch of astronomers together to say, boy, what a great thing. You should, Congress should build this. Whereas most of the radio astronomers at that time were saying, it's so much bigger than anything we have now, we won't even know what to look for. It was irresponsible, believe me. So Leo Goldberg and others were so shocked by this because he met a uh, congressman at some uh, cocktail party and they came up to him saying, why should we be building your NRAO at this time? Why should we be building your Kick Peak? I mean, we've given you Sugar Grove. Oh my God. That's when the decadal survey started. And what we have today is a result of that. Well, the decadal surveys, Field was very, very powerful in the decadal surveys. He was a, a consolidator. He was a, 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 a listener. He could listen to the needs of different groups and figure out how to put them all together. And he continued to build the SCL on that basis. And so it has is, it is survived and thrived since then. Okay, that nice little 60-inch telescope that was built as an experiment. Well, uh, in, the seven, in the 80s, a very interesting instrument was added to it, the Z machine by uh, Davis, Tonry, Latham, Dave Latham still there, John Hooker is no longer there. This was a digitized spectrograph that could take the spectra, very faint spectra, very faint objects of thousands of galaxies in a night. Uh, hundreds maybe in a night, I'm, I'm overreacting here. And they built up a huge map, a three-dimensional map of the radial velocities and directions, positions of galaxies in space and with that data, Margaret Geller and John Hukra found the overall structure, the largest structures in the universe are these bubbles and voids. And we now know the voids are dark matter. And the light matter, everything we know, 5% of the universe, is clustered around their surfaces. And so this is a vision of the universe that we never had before. Came from that lowly 60-inch telescope. We also, uh, at, at Smithsonian, have one of the most vibrant solar divisions. Uh, we uh, maintain the Solar Dynamics Observatory in, in orbit that gives us a near real-time reconnaissance of the sun uh, that you can come to the museum and watch to your heart's content, even if it's cloudy. And that's about all I have to say, other than saying, uh, to be continued, the Giant Magellan Telescope is is under construction. It is facing the same political and practical problems of limits that uh, the VLA faced along with the, um, uh, the, the old radome, the, the NIROC radome that I, I showed you. People are starting to say, can't these people building the next generation of telescopes get together and decide how to build one? Or at least uh, you know, combine them. And I know that the SAO people are taking that message very seriously. They were the ones who stepped back in 1972 and made the VLA possible. They may well have to be the ones again today, but don't tell them I said that. <laughs> we're still very active, of course, in the South Pole. You may know of the little glitch from uh, Bicep 2, 
Uh, they thought they found polarization in the uh, co cosmic gray uh, background, and it turned out to be intergalactic dust, but it's still a great machine, and it has a very, very fantastic future. And with that, I say the SAO is to be continued. Thank you very much. <coughs> I didn't go over time. Sorry. <laughs> I'm very, I'd be very happy to. Oh, I, th th this, this uh, congestion I got in Vienna, courtesy of the International Astronomical Union, because we were all told to vote on, the, on whether we still wanted the Hubble constant to be called the Hubble constant or whether we want it to be the Hubble Lemaitre constant. And you know how we've held up cards for Pluto? This time we all just coughed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, question. Moonwatch, moon moon yes. Yeah, a moon watch. yeah. Was that a was that just a, a, a name for observing uh, satellites that went over? So exactly. Okay. Yeah. Basically, the little uh, little telescopes, uh, like eight by fifty mon monoculars, would be fo focused on a, a mirror, flat mirror that would send your beam up onto some part of the meridian. There would be about 12 or 13 people sitting in a line, north-south line, and each one of them would be assigned a different altitude wedge on the meridian because they didn't know where the satellite was going to come over. They knew approximately when, so they got ready, and they're all sitting there, and if it went across your, your screen, boy, you got it. You, you got the fudge Sunday, you know. Yeah, and then those things were beamed in. Now, after a few passes, uh, about a week or so of, of data, the, the orbits were calculated well enough to bring in the, the cameras. Because these things were moving pretty fast. And uh, how do you move them uh, to actually take pictures that are useful? Uh, the the uh, Baker Nuns did that, but so did the Superschmitz, and many other reconnaissance cameras did too. But it was the Moonwatch people who, get, who provided the first ephemeris. Oh, yeah, good, good point, good point, good point, yeah. Why, why you would name that? Right. Because people, people knew about the moon. I mean, the satellite is a scientific term. As a that's, a good, that's a very good question. And uh, these were artificial moons. I think we, uh, I don't know how far back I have to go, but um, there was one of the, oh heavens, where was it? Space ages here, let's see. Please, red moon over London. Man-made moon, but then satellite. So it was a bit of both, but moon was the whole idea. It's an artificial moon, but good point. Uh, yeah, so, <laughs> well, my, my, my guess is, and Patrick McRae wrote the history of the, the, the book, Moon Watch, um, and he used the title, Keep Watching the Skies which is a really great title. Do you know why that's a great title? Does anybody know where that term came from? Uh, that's probably from World War II, right? We were watching well, Civil Air Patrol. Yeah, right, yeah. Exactly, yeah. But there's a famous movie, The Thing. Oh, the Remember the original? Oh, yeah, it's the original. Yeah, right. None of the remakes. Yeah. The, the reporter that's sitting down there, the last line of the movie, keep watching the skies. Keep watching. Yeah. <laughs> So, but seriously, Patrick picked up on that. And the idea of the moon, though, his, his interpretation is that J. Allen Hynek, who you may know for his UFO stuff, but he was, he was a, a good PR guy. And he would come up with something like moon, that kind of thing. Yeah, but good, good for raising that, yeah. Thoughts, questions? Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I'll be here through at least noon tomorrow and be very happy to, uh, to chew the fat. <laughs>